If you'll please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have a flag anywhere nearby? I, I don't think so. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, Sadie, if you'll give me roll call, please. Councillor Abels. Here. Councillor Dunsmore. Here. Councillor Gates. Here. Councillor Spangler. Here. Councillor Strobel. Here. Councillor Tenbush. Here. Mayor Drinkwine. Here. Thank you. Okay, we are at the first chance for citizen and community group comment. Uh, do I have anybody chiming in? Yeah. <clears throat> yep, we have um, Katinka here first, and then it looks like Joel would also like to speak after Katinka. So I'm going to bring Katinka in into the meeting. Okay, great. Is she coming on? Yep, she's here. Okay. Audio, just a sec. Okay. I'm unmuted. Let me check my. Oh, there I am. Okay, there you are. Hello. How are you? So, if you just want to give us your address and name and go ahead and uh, present. Katinka Brick, 421 Southwest Hawthorne Road, Estacado. So, you all read my letter. I assume that you got a couple of weeks ago. And of course, I was at the listening session with you. And I had the opportunity to review your comments at your review of the listening session. And before I talk about that, I would like to know if you have any questions to me about the letter. Anybody have any questions for Katinka regarding the letter? No? Not right off for me. Nope, nobody has any questions. Okay, so at your review, I was struck by the fact that all three of the men who spoke uh, were surprised to see the people with rifles at the two marches. And dismay was also the sense that I got. And I was rather struck by Mr. Gates's comment um, of what are, we, what are they going to do with those guns and if there was going to be a looting, would they then shoot a looter? Now, my feeling is that that is the job for the sheriff's department and not for some armed citizen on our streets. I'm, I have spoke with a couple of young people who attended both of those marches. I was unable to do so for medical reasons. And um, there were apparently people with guns standing on the city hall lawn that is illegal. You cannot carry a firearm onto a public building, a city hall, its grounds, a school, and its grounds. So right there, I think that's a question for the sheriffs who were there. They need to pay attention to the law to protect the citizens. So I was kind of surprised to see and hear that. One of the marches, I saw some Facebook live feed where there were people with holstered weapons talking about how they were there to protect things. And 20 feet away is a sheriff outside of his vehicle doing his job for which he's trained. So Sean, you said that you thought that the term long guns was broad, but some one of you also said that you were surprised to see AR-47s or AK, I personally don't know the difference. They're just big guns to me. Um, but that's the point. The point is to not be able to intimidate peaceful citizens with large guns. You also don't need a permit to buy a long gun in the state of Oregon. You only have to be 18 years of age. For a handgun, you have to be 21 and you have to get a permit for concealed and open carry. So to me, this is just an open source of potential vigilantism in a time of extreme um, hyper-partisanship. And I think it was Mr. Tenbush who said, well, it's only been a couple of times and I would have to wait to make any judgment on this until something actually happened. Well, then we want somebody to be shot and then it's like, oh, then we should make a rule. 
I mean, I know that's not your intent, but it could be extrapolated in that direction. So as I mentioned in my letter, um, and a couple of the people that I talked to at the, the bigger marches, because I attend the smaller Saturday protests, um, now that I can again. Um, but that the, this feeling of uh, the Estacada to our citizens who were the majority of the people at these marches and are 100% of the people at the Saturday rallies um, is that Estacada is a welcoming and um, charming small town that has reinvented itself from a logging community that had a real, pretty violent history and is now this sort of arts tourist rafting destination. And the idea that somebody can now legally walk on the streets of Estacada with a gun, a long gun, just any time, and into a store does not to me seem to promote economic vitality and tourism. Now, do we have questions? Do we have questions for Katika? Anybody would like to comment on that? Well, um, we clarified it at the last meeting, but my statement was um, 25 years of living here. The only, I've only seen twice people having guns, long guns strapped to them outside of their vehicles. Um, it's only happened twice in my, that I've seen in my 25 years, and it was at the two marches. So that's why I said, said it that way. Um, I, don't, I don't believe it's an issue in Estacada. I mean, like I said, I mean, 25 years, and I've seen it twice. Um, you know, if, if, we, if we see that people are carrying them more often, then we will definitely, um, you know, get involved and, you know, make a decision. But I really don't believe that it's an issue in Estacada, you know, because it's, you know, like I said, it's, I've only ever seen it twice. So two times is not an issue. Well, it, to me it is, but um, we're not going to be able to pass a law to, um, it's, it's just not, I don't believe that we, that we could pass the law to whole you know keep people from carrying long guns in, in the city limits um i think that we would uh like i said I, I just don't think that it's a it's a huge issue at this point i mean if people start to carry them again um you know if people start to carry them openly then you know we'll address it at that point but um sorry uh, i'm stepping on my word so okay, okay. Uh, Kimberly? yeah I, I struggled with this a lot after our workshop and I sat and I thought about it quite a bit um, because I know that we're saying we've seen it happen twice, but the two times it happened, it was clearly there as an intimidation tool and to try and stop opposing voices from being heard. And I feel like that's where the dangerous line, it's not like it was folks who were walking down the street and they were carrying a, 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 a long gun. They were there specifically to counter protest or counter counter the voices that they didn't agree with. Um, and whether it's under the, or, or protect something that they feel ownership of, because a lot of, a lot of us do, we feel ownership of Estacada. We wanna protect it. We wanna make sure that it, it stays the community that we love. But I really do struggle with the two times that we have seen it um, those two instances are not, there's, there's a common thread there. I, and I, I don't know what we can do. I agree with Jerry. I don't think we could get anything passed, but I do agree with you, um, Ms. Burke, that it's, it's something that we need to be very watchful of. And I don't want us to be in the point of we should have done something and then somebody gets shot and we're now reacting instead of being proactive. Um, I, I, I would like us to see us continue this conversation and, and move it forward a bit and maybe get some more community input. So I have a question. Does it have to go to a vote of the citizens or can you create a statement like you did about anti-racism? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, but I, I was doing a little bit of digging on this because I, you know, you bring up good points and, and seeing these other communities, Independence, Multnomah County, Oregon City, Portland, Salem, Tigard, Beaverton, 
um, that all have ordinances. Uh, as I was looking at it, um, it looked like these ordinances ban loaded long guns, that long guns aren't banned. And, and I guess I would want to know more. I'm, I'm no expert on any of this. I would want to know more on, on what can and can't be done. And then, like you said, Katinka, is this something that we can enact or does this need to go to the people as well too? And, and I would like more time to do some research on that or have research be done so I can really understand what our, our limitations are and our abilities are. That's fair enough. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Katie? Thank you, Mayor. Um, th and thank you, Katinka. I appreciate you bringing this to our attention. Um, I would say personally, I don't feel comfortable talking about um, a bill of rights amendment and any ways to infringe upon it without it going to a vote of the people. I don't think that that is an appropriate conversation for the seven of us to have just the seven of us. I think that that is a conversation that does need to have be had at a, a greater level than us. So whether or not I agree with anyone's position, um, because I don't think anyone does know what my true position is, um, I will just say it should always be a vote of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, anybody else wish to speak on that? No. I guess it's down to me, Katinka. You've known me for a while. I don't carry a gun. I uh, was out around the guns. I did not feel threatened by the guns. I did see the intimidation factor. Um, would I step forward and try to make a ruling to outlaw the guns? I can't say that I would. I don't think that's my right to do. I think that's a vote of the people as Katie brought up. And I would have to say that's where I would like it to stay. Um, but that's just me. Um, other than that, that's my comment on it. Um, anybody else wish to speak to this before we go on? No? So Katinka, we thank you for bringing that forward. You've had the answers from the council. Um, I don't know if it'll stop there. I'm sure the discussion will be had now. It's out there, so people will be talking about it. Um, I'm sure it'll be back. So I hope we gave you some answers to your questions. I don't know. Well, I would just say as far as infringing on people's rights, uh, I'm sorry to be snarky, but it didn't seem to be such a problem to infringe on somebody's right to peacefully protest. But now it's okay to support somebody's right to carry a gun. So. Well, I'm sure that's directed towards me and I can appreciate your, your feelings and I wouldn't try to um, change that. I mean, it's the way you feel, I understand. Um, but I cannot speak to their rights at this particular time. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sadie, who's the next? Anybody else? Yeah, we have Joel Lipke that would like to speak. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? <laughs> I think we're having technical difficulties here. You got him on your end? My, he's there and now he's gone. Give it a couple more seconds here and then we'll have to move on. Yeah, and we do have the second opportunity at the end of the meeting too, if he does. Oh, looks like he's here. Hang on. Okay. I feel dumb. I had my mute button on my headphones. <laughs> I want the first first time I did that. All right. Um, hey guys. So my address is uh, 420 uh, Clackamas Way um, here in Estacada. Uh So the reason why I'm coming forward is, as you guys may have seen, on the uh, 29th, our, our group uh, Estacada Community Watch uh, program has a uh, Back to Blue uh, rally in March going on. 
Um, so at this uh, at this event, we're going to be uh, trying to present some uh, award, basically some plaques and awards to uh, law enforcement um, and kind of give them a uh, overall support from not only our group, but the, you know, kind of how the community feels about everything. And so my request that I'm coming here for is I'd like to see if we can have uh, the mayor as Mayor Drinkwine present and maybe the council uh, attend as well to present these awards to uh, law enforcement and uh, the uh, first responders that we're going to be giving them to. There's going to be some bricks dedicated from the memorial um, down there. And um, we just have a couple uh, plaques and I think a handmade uh, uh, kind of wooden sign thing that was put together. So uh, that's that's basically why I'm here is to request that um, and uh, you know, we'll be putting in our uh, March uh, permit request as well. So um, that's it. Just want to see what you guys had to say about that and, and everything. Okay. Um, counselors, anybody wish uh, to speak to that? Joel, what what uh, what day and time was that? Uh, the uh, March starts about uh, four o'clock on uh, the 29th of this month, and I think we'll be presenting. If I remember right, the schedule is 5:30. Okay. Anybody else wish to speak to that? I'm fine with the mayor presenting. I should also probably be in attendance. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to get there. Um, I don't get off work till five o'clock on Saturday. So, but I'll do my best to be there. Awesome. Okay, if, uh, it, we can always adjust the schedule slightly if you think you can be there by a certain time. Um, but we do have a currently plan for five thirty to present. So. Yeah. Um, I'm usually in Estacada around five forty-five. Um, I'll just get there as quick as I can. So sounds good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll um, come. I think I should be able to come down as well. Um, okay. I'm doing a foreign exchange student this year, and the 29th was thrown out as when she might fly in, so it might depend on that. It just depends on when she comes. So okay, that's good. Great. Can you tell us a little bit more about what awards you will be giving out and how the awardees were determined? Uh, basically, what the awards are is just a general presentation to uh, the law enforcement. We'll be giving it to Clackamas County uh, sheriffs. And then we're going to pull a representative from the Clackamas County Fire Department to come in as well. And it's just a general award kind of saying thank you from the community, you know, for the service and that uh, we support you. Um, we haven't had exact wording yet. Um, I can always bring forward what the plaque is going to say. But uh, basically, okay. it's just, you know, a way of showing that our community uh, supports them and our group supports them and that, uh, you know, we, we appreciate them. Mm -hmm. uh, I will not be able to be in attendance. I'm, I'm, I have a predetermined out of town that weekend. Um, but if there's anything else we can do as a sign of support, I would be happy to help. Excellent. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, Casey, what, are you going to be around that week? Um, I might be, but I'm just got to make sure that I don't have my child. So it would just be very dependent. So I don't like to make any promises. Okay. Just, just an FYI, there will be a, um, there will be at a family event kind of going on down there when we're as well. We have some uh, games and stuff and a barbecue going on. So. Okay, great. Paul, are you going to be able I to make it? it? I would love to. I do not know my schedule for that day at this point though. Okay. All right. Next well, Joel, I think we'll have to get back to you on some people. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I can, I will have to check with uh, Denise and uh, Sadie to make sure that that's okay to do. Um, and then we can get back to you after I find out if that's okay. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you guys' time and uh, let you guys get back to business. Well, thank you, sir. Um, okay, do I have anybody else, Sadie, on the line? Nope, I don't see any more hands. Okay, great. Um, well, now we're moving on to the consent agenda. So at this point, I will ask if there's any questions or everybody had a chance to read the consent agenda. I did. And actually I have a couple of things. Um, on the consent agenda for the Estacada city council meeting minutes from July 27th under the LOC legislative priority ballot it says yeah. that the council discussed the priorities, but uh, we actually did not have a council discussion that evening. So I would like that uh, sentence removed, please. If you'd like it to, re if you'd like to replace it with anything, um, I'm okay with. Uh, Councilor Dunsmuir discussed housing priorities and the uh, state highway funds formula, and Councilor Spangler discussed broadband priorities. 
Um, also, the resolution 2020-015, a resolution for Estacada City Council designating the Estacada Enterprise Zone for Electronic Commerce. I believe that that should actually go under council business. I think that uh, I have a couple of questions about that and would like to have more of a discussion about it um, rather than just approving it in the consent agenda. Okay. Um, Sadie. Is there a way to move uh, resolution 2020-015 down to council business? Yeah, that can we okay? just add it to as the last item on there and I'll try to see if I can get Matt on the calls to give you more information. Excellent, okay. And then as far as the minutes, um, is that okay to change that or? Yeah, I need, you know, consensus or a motion to change them and then a second and. All right, so, so I'm looking. I move to approve as I've uh, previously noted. Okay. Um, I want to check with the counselors. Is that okay for the changes? Is everybody okay with that before we move on? Do we have a, have a second? A second. Okay, I have first and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, all those um, opposed? Okay, so the changes can be made. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to ask for a motion for the consent agenda as is with the changes to the minutes and we've moved resolution 2020-015 to the uh, council business. Uh, do I have a first? I move to approve the consent agenda with uh, the alterations that we've made. Okay, all right, uh, do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, I have a first and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Changes are made. Thank you very much. Okay, moving right along. We are at, at uh, department and committee reports. So I know none of you have had commissions or, or liaison for anything. So that's kind of a uh, oblivious question to ask because uh, it's really sir, not going to apply. Mayor, mayor that is not true. I did attend the C4 meeting last Thursday. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, sorry guys. Um, just a couple of updates. Actually, last uh, week the C4 committee was pretty dedicated to the 205 project. Um, ODOT has hired a new director, uh, I'm sorry, project director for the 205 project. Her name is Mandy Putney. She was an amazing presenter. Um, that being said, there's going to be a lot of changes to um, the initial funding, uh, the, the budget and the funding sources and everything that, uh, that they're doing on their side. I do want uh, to share with everyone um, that there's a letter from the R1 Act that uh, the C4 committee would like Estacada to send in support of um, the 205 project and moving it ahead of other projects. Um, anyways, if uh, Denise, you don't mind getting uh, in touch with someone from the C4 committee about exactly what letter they wanted us as a city to send, that way we could present it to them. Uh, or to, to us again. Um, that being said, right now, there are a lot of different bids out there for tolling. So if you have any connections to anyone from ODOT or your uh, local um, state representative or Senator Olson, if, you, if you're in communication with any of them, tell them that we don't support tolling um, because it seems like ODOT and the county and everybody's got a lot of bids out there for that. So it was actually a really great discussion. There's a lot of stuff happening with the 205 project. I recommend that you all look into it. There's a lot of surveys out there online, not only about tolling, um, but also about where the, um, the project funds are most needed and things like that. So please look into it. Please support the 205 project. It is pretty important to our region. Um, to a lot of the people who call Estacada home because they commute over that bridge, the Abernathy Bridge that they're really talking about. So um, really look into it. And if you've got any questions, give me a call or shoot me an email. Um, the C4 committee got a really big update last week. So yeah, I guess that's the update. Okay, well, thank you. Any other updates that I might've passed over? I'm sorry, no? Okay, Denise, are you on? Um, I don't really have a report, but I just want to clarify. So does the city council want staff to work on a letter supporting the I-205 project over the other projects? Okay. All right. Uh, let me ask the council. Um, would you like her to draft a letter in support of the I-205 expansion 
uh, that they're working on right now. Is that something that you would uh, want to uh, stand behind? I'm asking council if there's anybody, you know, uh, just give me a, a nod if, if yes or uh, really? if no. I uh, just really quick clarification, Denise, I think that there's a letter already drafted. So really it wouldn't have to take any staff time to draft a new letter. I just want everyone else to know that too. So this is really just as SDK to stand behind a letter that's already drafted um, that other cities in our county are already sending into their local representatives expressing the importance of 205 over other projects in, um, in the, two, the, the uh, transportation 217 budget. Um, so that's, that's what we're asking right now. Okay. 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 So I'll bring that letter to the next council meeting. That right, sounds, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank perfect. You. Thank you so much, Denise. Okay. Ah, that's, and I don't, I don't have anything else tonight. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Um, we are done at council business now then. First on council business is a resolution 2020-006. Mr. Mayor, I think Paul had a question on the last oh, one. Sorry, sorry, sorry Paul. Oh, that's all right. Thanks, Jerry. I, for back to the C4, where can we learn more about that? I think I'd want to see what the priorities are, um, you know, if we're going to be advocating one priority over the other ones. I'm coming into this late. You guys may have talked oh, about this in the past few months. Um, yeah, so- how, how can I get up to speed? You can just point me to a resource. Yeah, so C4 is the Clackamas County Coordinating Committee. Um, it's, a, it's a committee that a uh, representative from each city in the county goes and sits at the board for. Um, they talk about housing and transportation. And um, if you go to their website, you'll be able to pull up all the, the packets and everything showing a, a bunch of slides from uh, previous meetings and other presentations that we've received already. Um, but really look up House Bill 2017 because that had a lot of transportation funding in it. Um, and that comes up a lot during the C4 committee meetings. Um, and that's going to be where you kind of learn about the, the funding resources that are out there and how they're already allocated. And the unfortunate reality for, I guess, Portland is that the Rose Porter project has to be put off. It's not going to be done anytime soon. That being said, the 205 project is the planning stages are already done. The design phase is already done. We're ready to go into construction, but what we need first is funding. So there's a lot of people out there with, you know, uh, a lot of different resources that are trying to pull in funding for 205. And what we really need right now is for the sit for the state to stand up and say, okay, all that money that we had set aside for the um, Rose Porter project, let's go ahead and use it for 205 because Rose Porter is not getting done for a while and it's basically paid for. So let's go ahead and pay for 205. Um, find uh, other funding resources because it is going to cost somewhere around $500 million in order to do all the changes for widening and seismic uh, upgrades and things like that for the Abernathy Bridge and just beyond that into Tualatin. So um, really, it's a, it's a tremendous project um, that's been underway for a number of years, and there's a lot of uh, different material out there if you want to look it up. Um, really start with uh, those resources, and if you want to get in touch with me, about you know how to learn more, uh, I can get you in touch with the right people. Okay. Super. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. Thank you, Katie, for that. Um, now moving right along. Is there any other questions that are up before I? Okay. I'm going to move on to the first thing on the list there, Resolution 2020-006, a resolution requesting Clackamas County uh, surrender judification over certain portions of county roads as described herein. So, Denise, maybe I can ask yeah. you. Hi. Yep. Uh, so this, uh, this resolution, there are three um, portions of roadways that are inside the city limits that we do not have jurisdiction over, that we would like to have jurisdiction over. So when development occurs, they will happen to our standards instead of county standards. Um, some of the county standards out in the Henman, Ren Henman and Glen Ran area uh, they don't require sidewalks and all that, and we have a lot of building going to go on there. And then there's, there, we discovered there was a portion of cemetery that has already been improved, but that is not under our jurisdiction. And that is the one that they will actually pay us some money to take over. So that's where the 11200 comes in. They're paying for cemetery. And they have a... They have a um, formula they use is if the road is bad enough, that's when they pay you. And the Ren and Henman are not, so we aren't going to get any money for those. But um, that money we can use to help with uh, maintenance on 
or street, you know, if we want to improve either of those roads when they get ready for improvement. So uh, if you, anyone has any questions. Yeah. Any questions for Denise on those? Paul? Are, are these three roads the only three roads then that, that are uh, within the Clackamas County, I guess, jurisdiction that are within the Estacada city limits? Um, I think there is part of um, Wade Street that is that's up um, past uh, like where the new development Campanella is and I'm trying to think I think there was two places that we weren't ready to take over yet um, Deuce Road is one of them because uh, we didn't, uh, we only have a portion of those, so we're leaving those under their jurisdiction right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions to this? No? Okay, thank you, Denise, on that clarification. I appreciate that. You're, you're welcome. Yeah. So we um, just need a motion to pass the resolution. Okay, well, you've heard the uh, uh, explanation behind this. Uh, can I get a motion? I move to approve 2020-006. Okay, I've got a first. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have a first and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you, Denise. All right, moving on to the next item. We have the Roundup Program, Estacada Area Food Bank. Uh, yeah, so this one, um, uh, right now, we, um, we help the Estacada Community Foundation out. Um, people can, um, when they sign up for their utility bill with the city, there's a box they can check and they can contribute to the Estacada Community Foundation. Um, I think it says 5, 10, or 20, but you can put any number in if you wanted to do 100 a month. And so that shows up on their... Um, their their utility bill when it gets sent out and then we collect that money and quarterly we will write a check to the foundation for whatever amount has been turned into us um, so there's really not a lot of work for us um, well there's no work because it's part of the program that that um, generates the bill so the food bank is in desperate need of funding so they were wondering if they could um, take advantage of this also. Um, again, it's all voluntary and they don't know if anyone will sign up, but it's just one more way for them to raise funds for their, their service that they're doing for the city. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for a motion to accept this or you're looking for just a consensus? Well, just council consensus. We just wanted to be sure we, you know, you guys were aware of it and, and, um, uh, just council consensus on this if, if everyone is okay with it. Okay. I love it. Do it. Uh, can I just make a quick comment? Okay. I want everybody to know that, sorry, that I am a member of the board for the food bank. Just wanted to get that out there. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, Kimberly? So <clears throat> I noticed that the discussion here, it says in 2001, this program was put in for the estimated, estimated Community Foundation. Is that program still yes. running or? So, okay, so yes. now that people yes. will have two choices, either the community foundation or the food bank? Right. Or, both. or they could do both, or, they, or none. Okay. You know, it's, it's just going to be on their utility when they sign up. It's an option if they want to donate. Okay. Oh, it's not a monthly thing. It's when you would sign up. No, it's a monthly, right, right. A monthly donation. It, it is on the monthly. Like, if they wanted to do a dollar a month, they would put on their $1. It comes out monthly on the utility bill. But if say you wanted to do it for the month of August, but not the month of September, that's not easily done. It's at the beginning when no, it's- No, we would okay. probably, someone that wants we would probably just have them go to the food bank and make a donation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh-huh. Any other questions? No, okay, so do we have a consensus? I'm thinking we probably do. Um, yeah, it looks like everybody's in, in agreement with that. Thank you. Well, thank you on that explanation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, next on the list, we have the ordinance 2020-002, an ordinance of the city of Estaquita, Oregon, to related to a construction excise tax for affordable housing, adopting related administrative provisions and establishing new code chapter 3-42. So I'm gonna hand this over to you, Katie. Um, All right, am I still there? Yeah. Okay, hold on. So Sadie's supposed to be sharing my screen very soon. And I honestly don't know how to do that. Oh, so I, I can't share your screen. I can share my own screen. Oh, okay. How do I share my screen? There should be a... Yeah, down at the bottom. It should, or maybe the top for iPads. And it should say share screen. And oh, you should be able to do that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Um, that screen recording uh-oh someone help me i can um katie if you want i can try to pull it up for you and share my screen you want to do that yeah give me one second um if yeah uh, yeah because otherwise i don't know how to share my content i'm sorry you guys this zoom stuff and the ipad i mean i just don't do it um except for <laughs> katie you sent me a file that I can't open. I sent you the keynote. That was the only way for me to. Oh, oh my gosh. How do <laughs> well, I do that? what meeting was it at? Um, Sadie, can you, what meeting hold did on. you get that she from? Um, hold on. Hold on. Oh, I did something. There we go. Huh. Something. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I actually already gave this presentation uh, May of last year, but I did update some of the numbers and I have in front of me, but not in front of you. And I apologize, the presentation that I also gave to the infrastructure committee. So just to uh, um, give everyone a brief history, um, I did present this as an option back in May of last year, uh, the uh, construction excise tax. And it was the consensus of the council that I then presented to the infrastructure committee. Um, so I did that also. And the infrastructure committee gave uh, one piece of feedback, which is that when I originally presented the idea, it was for residential uh, construction only, not commercial. And when I presented it to the infrastructure committee, they asked that we also adopt a commercial construction excise tax and not limit it to only residential. So that being said, I have no idea how to move past this. Oh my gosh, what? What do you mean it wasn't found? Oh no, my content went away. Crap. <clears throat> Sorry guys, I really don't know how to do any of this. Okay, can you see it now? Nope. No. Ah, all right. Um, start broadcast. Okay. Okay, hold on. Did that do something? Well, you're back to, it, it looks like creating a monopoly. Oh, good. Okay. So that's my presentation. Okay. So we're on to this. Okay, okay good. So a 1% construction excise tax for Estacada. It can do a lot. Let me tell you why. So the updated numbers last year, when I presented this exact presentation, it was 376 homes approved for single or approved for construction in the next five years. Today, that number is 685 and zero apartment complexes, what? All right, so they, we already know the back history, developers say multifamily does not pencil out. So what that means is teachers hired by the Estacada School District often leave their job after a short period of time due to a lack of housing, because instead of getting a house closer to their job, they get jobs closer to their home. Uh, industry leaders who consider our industrial park often complain of a lack of housing for their workforce. Um, after children leave for college, they often do not come back due to a lack of housing options, and it is limiting our, the demographic of the population moving into our city, aka it is um, restricting our, diver our diversity. There's a reason that we don't have a very diverse population, and it's because our housing particularly dis um, limits that. Uh, last year, I did get a, present, uh, a statement from Ryan Carpenter, the uh, Estacada School District Superintendent. And as he says here, in looking at the demographics of the students served in the Estacada School District, it is clear that there is a need for increased affordable housing. Uh, approximately half of our students are receiving free and reduced meals. 
and 24 of our students are currently identified as living without stable housing. Um, I also got a, a statement from Matt Lorenzen, who was not brief, and I think he's on the phone call tonight. Thank you for joining us, Matt. Seriously, dude. Um, but basically, ongoing studies of the city's housing inventory and economic opportunities are demonstrating a strong need for additional workforce housing. That is, housing options that are affordable for wage earners employed within the city of Estacada and surrounding areas. In concrete terms, this means high-density housing, more apartments. The city's comprehensive plan and zoning map and development code re requirements need to be revised in order to allow for more of this type of development. And we are working on that. And great news, you guys, we've done it. We did it, the hard work's been done. Uh, we implemented that about six months ago. Um, that being said, additionally, incentives and subsidies can be offered to developers and builders in order to make multifamily development in Estacada more attractive and profitable. But the city has neither the funding nor the programming to offer such incentives at this time. A construction excise tax is one way that jurisdictions can raise funds in order to incentivize the construction of affordable workforce housing. And I wanna stress those words, affordable workforce housing. We are not talking about building more low income housing. I'm not talking about a homeless shelter. Although while those might come down the line, we are talking about affordable workforce housing. That being said, we move into SB 1533B, which was passed in the state of Oregon in 2016. Uh, it does allow cities to require a certain portion of the new housing units rented or sold as affordable. They call that inclusionary zoning. I have that crossed out in my presentation because I am not proposing that idea. It is just one of the many things that we can do because of this bill that was passed. But it also allows cities and counties to enact a construction excise tax. Uh, but it does not require them to adopt both. So again, we don't have to adopt both and I'm not actually proposing that we adopt inclusionary zoning quite yet. I like the idea of just a construction excise tax right now. So that being said, uh, a construction excise tax establishes a new authority for cities and counties to impose a construction excise tax on construction of new structures or construction adding square footage to an existing structure. Cities may impose a CET on residential construction at a rate of 1% of the value of the permit value of construction, uh, new commercial and industrial construction with no cap on the rate of the CET, um, and that's what it can uh, be taxed. And then here we go, we go to what is the cost of uh, the developer of the average home? So I just got this data today from Tracy Hobda. Thank you so much for getting me that information last minute, seriously. Um, but the average permit valuation for a home being built in Estacada today is 290,000. 1% of that is only $2,900. It really kind of is, and I hate putting it like this, little bit of a drop in the bucket when you look at those two numbers. It is 1%, you guys. Um, last year, we put a $10,000 tax per year on Red Fox Hotel. So $2,900 as a one-time tax really is a drop in the bucket compared to even what we did to that guy. So when we talk about the potential revenue, $2,900 is our average. We've got 685 homes approved. You guys know what that pot looks like at the end? We're looking at almost $2 million at the end of a five year approval period for our permits. So where would all that money go? Well, if uh, you were on the council last year when I gave this presentation, you probably remember how some of the money already breaks down, but I went ahead and made this pie chart. So um, administrative costs, so the cost that it takes our city to implement and track the tax and do the paperwork and do all that stuff, about $80,000 over the course of the next five years um, and we'll receive that in revenue is what I'm saying uh, and then $297,000 would go to the Oregon Housing and Community Services which um, by the way if you don't know OHCS basically oversees all types of housing in the state of Oregon and they've already pledged to have all of the money that they receive from a certain jurisdiction from the CET reinvested in that area. And one of the main things that they do with that money that they get from the CET and reinvest into that area is provide grants for first time home buyers. So what they're gonna do is actually use a lot of that $300,000 that we give them from this construction excise tax 
and use that to then give to people who are then reinvesting in our community and buying the new homes that are being built and actually becoming homeowners. And they're making home ownership a lot more attainable for everybody. Um, and then we go on to affordable housing programs. Now, affordable housing programs, you guys, is a very broad general definition according to the ordinance that we have and we can spend a lot of time talking about exactly what the best use of this money is but look at that pot that is a seven hundred thousand dollar pot over the course of five years and really we can do so much with that money even if it's giving developers extra incentives for providing low-income housing or units that are set aside specifically for those meeting a certain area median income, which is that standard that we use to define poverty. So what if we could actually use $700,000 to provide affordable housing programs? Or as we start meeting the eviction deadline coming up or the eviction moratorium that's going to expire at the end of September, a lot of our residents in Estacada who might not have been able to pay their rent over the last six months are going to be stuck and they're gonna to have to pay that money back and they're not gonna have a way out and we're gonna end up with another homeless problem in, a, in the very near future. So think of all the things we could do with that money. And then the very rest of it, almost a million dollars that we could use for developer incentives. If you consider the fact that one uh, systems development charge per door is about $13,000 in the city of Estacada, I mean, really $130,000 is gonna fund 100 homes or something like that, or 10 homes. It's the fact that we could have a million dollars left over in this pot, and this is just using the residential numbers. This is not con commercial construction. I haven't even gotten that far with the numbers of commercial construction. This is just residential alone at 1% based on the current averages, based on the current numbers. So basically, it, it all breaks down exactly how I said, 4% administrative, 50% developer, 35% to our affordable housing programs, as we get to define it as Estacada, and then the rest of the 15% goes to Oregon Housing and Community Services. So really, um, the reality of it is we could be looking at a million dollars in developer incentives, $700,000 in affordable housing programs for Estacada as defined by Estacada, and almost $300,000 in revenue to the OHCS that is pledged to be reinvested into Estacada affordable housing. Um, so that's that presentation. Let me see if I can get back to Zoom. I think I'm done with my broadcast. Um, so that being said, I have already drafted the construction excise tax. This is actually based on Milwaukee's uh, not only original uh, adoption of the construction excise tax, but also with their most recent uh, edit to it. So they've already implemented it, had it very successful in their city, found a flaw, fixed the flaw, and what I'm presenting to you is essentially what they have in their city as it is today. Um, it's been very successful for their city. And something else that I do kind of want to point out, not necessarily because it's related to all of this bigger discussion, but um, the housing needs analysis that was completed last year um, I have a copy of it in front of me. And what's really interesting, if you think of the number of homes that we have approved for development in the next five years, it's 685. According to the housing needs analysis that we had with Clackamas County last year, we were only expected to have 694 new households in the next 20 years. So we really have to do something. Um, what is also really exciting, um, and I, it's not a part of my presentation because it's uh, new information to me as well, um, the commercial construction excise tax that the infrastructure committee uh, did recommend that we adopt, um, not only will 50% of that fund go to the developer incentives for workforce housing, but then the other 50% of that fund doesn't go to OHCS and it doesn't go to uh, an affordable housing program it actually goes to whatever we need it to as it, as it stands for our economic development, including if you look at the ordinance, um, and again, this is based on what uh, Milwaukee has been able to do, but things like our wastewater treatment plan, our, uh, let me see, sorry, I've got so many papers in front of me. Um, anyone got it in front of them? All the different things we can, oh, here it is. 
50% uh, for economic development programs with an emphasis on areas of the city that are subject to plans designated as eligible by the city. The eligible plans as of this date of this ordinance are the city comprehensive plan, parks master plan, transportation system plan, active transportation plan, wastewater facilities plan, natural hazards mitigation plan, urban renewal plan, downtown Estacada and Riverside area plan, water system master plan, stormwater master plan, and street master plan. Additional eligible plans may be designated by the city council. And just so you guys are aware, the Milwaukee City Council used COVID relief as one of their programs that they designated eligible for that fund. So back in May, they were able to distribute $130,000 amongst small business owners in Milwaukee because of COVID um, and due to COVID relief. Um, that being said, um, those are my proposals. I think I covered everything. Um, if anybody has any questions for me, um, I really do believe in the, um, in the construction excise tax as being a very valuable tool that we can use. And I think that it can make a huge difference for what we're able to offer our citizens in, in terms of housing. Okay. Thank you. Now you can take a breath. That was uh, well <laughs> I tried to make it, There's a lot of content in here. I've been learning so much about this for the last two years. And if you guys don't know, I've been in housing since 2011, 2012, something like that. Um, and uh, I mean, it means a lot to me. Uh, when I got onto the council, I did attend the housing and uh, homelessness communities uh, or task force, the, the task force that the county had set up before. Um, I learned all of this information about a construction excise tax from a really amazing woman named Alma Flores. Um, she used to be the community development manager for the city of Milwaukee. She gave me a lot of this information and has talked to its, its successes in their city. And I've seen it be successful in other cities and I really am quite excited to see it be as successful in Escapeda. We thank you for your passion. I think uh, the counselors, maybe Jerry, you have a question? So. Um, I don't have a problem with the commercial side of it. Um, I have a little bit of a problem with the residential side of it. I just don't want to deter um, anybody from building an Estacada. I know it's a small little chunk, but you know, it's a small chunk now. Um, what's to say in the future that, you know, that this tax isn't, somebody doesn't try to raise this tax. So um, not saying that we're going to, but um, the one part that I do have a problem with is the, uh, like the the remodel portion or the upgrade portion. Um, I don't like that. Um, I don't think that we should be putting that tax forward. Um, I don't think we should move this forward with that involved um, without a vote from the city, from the citizens of Estacada. Um, anytime we want to add a tax to existing citizens, um, existing builds, um, you know, if I, if, you know, say Kimberly wanted to, you know, add, add, do an addition to her house, she, you know, she's already, I don't know, I just don't agree with that portion of it. Um, but I don't have a problem with the commercial side. And, um, you know, I don't really have a huge issue with new construction side. But um, um, I do have a question for Matt, though, um, oh. if Matt is listening. Well, um, I'm sorry, do you mind if I actually respond to your last question that, um, that you brought up? I didn't really ask a question, so. Oh, okay. Well, then that's fine. If you want to ask Matt a question, he wasn't really part of this presentation, but that's fine if you have a question. Uh, I know, but Matt has a lot of information that um, could actually help me, so. Matt, are you on there? Let's see here. I, hey. I am here. Okay. Hey, hey Matt. Um, do you think that adding this construction excise tax will deter anyone from, um, you know, these developers from building in Estacada, do you think it would be a deterrent for them? Um, you know, I'm not a developer, and so it's hard for me to say, uh, you know, without a doubt how someone might react to it. But um, when you look at the city's SDC charges for uh, just use single family residents as like a baseline metric, Estacada's SDC charges fall about middle of the pack in terms of what a city usually charges for one front door for a single family home. You know, you'd have a, you'd have a Westland Lake Oswego at the top and maybe a different smaller jurisdiction towards the bottom. And we're, 
we're kind of in between and I think that's a good place for us to be. By, by adding this 1%, I don't think it moves us up very high, uh, much further in that uh, sort of ranking. Um, uh, help me out here, Katie. What did you say the single family residence SDC charges when you add it all together? The last I heard was about 13,000. Okay, and that actually sounds low. Oh, that was for a multifamily front door. Is that right? No, that was that was for single that I that I had heard, but that's but okay. that was also from a, well probably a year ago. Yeah, my memory also may be failing me, but at any rate, by adding an additional say, as you said, twenty nine hundred dollars or one percent, whatever that happens to pencil out to be. I don't think that it actually changes the calculus a whole lot for a developer on whether or not they would move forward because they're just going to bake that cost into the final sales price of the home. And so all this really does is incrementally increase the cost of a single family home and that additional revenue then helps fund multifamily development, which we do need. And if it does deter some single family development, I guess I can't say one way or another, but perhaps that's not a bad thing. If we're trading a few single family homes for more diverse housing, that may actually be a good trade off. That's for you to decide. Um, I don't know if I'm making any sense now. We're giving you nope. information. No, you're very clear. You did great. I don't, great, I don't see good. it as being a, a major deterrent to be brief. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, um, I do want to say one thing. I, I do have one more thing to add, actually, to um, Councillor Tenbush's uh, 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 comment about, um, you know, the improvements and such. There is actually a quite extensive list of exemptions if you wanted to look at them um, in the in the in the ordinance that I've written. Um, and in fact, one of them in particular for the accessory dwelling units, we have uh made it basically mandatory in our uh our ordinance that those types of developments are exempt for at least five years so really you know if there is any sort of exception that anyone would want to add to this list for any valid reason i'm sorry if someone is going to be remodeling a home that their kitchen remodel alone is going to be more than a hundred thousand dollars or their bathroom remodel is going to be more than $100,000 just for the sake of it, then I, I don't really have a problem with asking that person for a 1% tax to help fund other people who are really not as fortunate to have $100,000 bathrooms. That being said, if there are any exemptions that we want to add to this list, this exemptions list does exist. And even after it's adopted, there is still an appeals process to go through if anyone wanted to add anything to that exemptions list after we pass it tonight. So I just want to put that out there that if you do have a concern like that, or if anyone else has a concern like that, that they do have the option of putting it onto the exemption list and that I think is already a pretty fair list that exists. So. Thank you, Katie. Paul, you had a question? Just, I, I had a lot of the same concerns, Jerry um, and, and, uh, I was looking into this earlier just to try to learn more about this, but I do think with the remodel piece, it looks like we're talking square footage addition as opposed to remodeling, where we're not looking to tax somebody on on you know putting in a nicer bathroom or something like that, but it would be it would be that uh, the addition of square footage is about as far as the remodeling goes. Um, yeah, it does. Thank you for clarifying that, Paul. The the one percent, the one percent on there. How, how did we come up with that? Because it looks like we've got the ability to to set this tax anywhere between zero and one percent. One percent being the max that we can we can tax on this. Um, I, I looked around. Eugene's 0.5 percent. Metro's 0.12 percent. Medford's 0.33 percent. But Portland, Hood River, Cannon Beach, Corvallis—they're all at one percent. Um, what, what's the thought behind us doing the max tax on that? Um, well, seeing as how right now we have enough homes approved over the next five years than people were thinking we were going to have over the next 20, I figured that they could probably help at the max because we're going to probably need that money to help accommodate all of them. So. Okay. And 
one of the things it looks like a lot of a lot of cities have adopted this we are, mm -hmm. we are coming to the table i'm glad to see that we're going to be looking at to, towards something that could help with um with the housing here what at this point we don't have anything in mind though to do with the money is that right this would just be not specifically tax. no not specifically i would love to see that maybe we adopt some sort of a subcommittee or adopt some sort of additional rules or something like that it's going to be a long time before we actually have any sort of amount of money established so that we can do anything with it you know productively um and i'm hoping that by that time that we have this already in place. I do want to share some numbers with you guys, actually, based on the numbers that Tracy gave me. Um, there, are, if so, I, I I expressed earlier that I brought this to the table over a year ago. Um, just in 2020 alone, so not even looking at the second half of 2019, but just in 2020 alone, um, we have issued 75 permits at uh, at the uh, average permit valuation that I showed you earlier. We've already lost out on two hundred and seventeen thousand dollars that we could have had established to uh, to be able to support these kinds of programs. That whenever we de decide what those programs look like, you know, that we might not end up with anything that we might be able to to ask for. Um, really, six hundred and eighty-five homes is a lot of homes in the next five years, and if we are going to adopt this construction excise tax, we might as well do it now while they, we have such a boom of housing happening around us. And then maybe if we find that, you know, development has slowed down and we really need to slow down the development, people here in Estacada are complaining about how many subdivisions are going up so quickly, you guys. This is kind of a problem that there are so many subdivisions happening so quickly. And I mean, really, if we're going to do it, I think that we should just do it now and then kind of decide how to spend that money later. Um, again, the ordinance that I have written out is what Milwaukee adopted and it seems to have worked out perfectly for them, so. Okay. Paul, do you have any yeah. more to add to that? Looking over this, it, it took me about, I don't know, seven or eight times to read this thing through. I, this is, if I'm gonna adopt something, I kind of want to understand it and I, I you know, maybe some other ones are more up to speed on some of this stuff, but there was one area that was particularly confusing to me under the exemptions. Um, A1, um, where it talks about residential housing units, including detached housing and market rate multifamily housing projects that are subject to a deed restriction or other mechanism, mechanism acceptable to the city, ensuring that the unit, and it goes on, uh, could you or could somebody give me a, a recap of what that means? Um, yeah, so I don't think that it seems very fair that we tax the people who we are incentivizing to build. We're basically just in, ex excluding anybody that we would use for develop, that we would give developer incentives to, to build affordable housing. So that's what that's saying there? Yeah, that's saying that we won't tax the people that are building affordable housing. So we, we want people to build affordable housing. So if you come in here and you build affordable housing, we're not going to ask you to pay a construction excise tax on it. So the, the medium household income for a period of at least 30 years following the date of issuance of the building permit on to which the improvement value is based and, the remain and, re, and that remain affordable. Um, it, oh, is okay. So yeah, area median income is based on how much money is being made within a certain jurisdiction. So when the median income um, is right now, I think for our area, it was like 600, hold on, uh, median income was $50,000 as of last year. So last year, our area median income was $50,000. If you are at 80% of that and below, then you are what we consider to be a uh, lower income, is that your, your household is 80% below area median income. If you're at median income or if you know, you're above 80% AMI, then you're not considered low income. Um, and we really, uh, you know, and, and, and you're considered basically being able to afford your own market rate apartment. Um, so that being said, all of the, that jargon that, that you read is, um, it, it's just how, how everyone in the state of Oregon, the Oregon Housing Community Services, um, you know, how they define low income households is area median income, 
80 percent and below okay they, yeah, that's what that is okay. that's then that, that's all that jargon is um so Again, we're not talking this, developers at this point. We're talking Joe Schmo uh, that's that's building. You know, they've saved up, they've got a property, and now they want to build their house. That's who we're talking about here for this one. Is that right? What? what? No, we're talking about multifamily units. So who is multifamily using housing project? Somebody that's trying to build their own home, Paul, would be paying a one percent tax. Would be Paul, yeah, would be paying a one percent tax. So somebody that did, and, and, okay, so somebody trying to build their own home would would pay the tax. Somebody it's looking to build a, a or an outbuilding on their pro, uh, property would be looking to build their only if they're doing it within city limits. Yeah, yeah. right. So for someone who buys like five acres outside of Estacada, they're not paying nothing. If right. people are buying a plot of land in Estacada and building a home on that plot of land, then they will be subject to pay this 1%. Gotcha. Mm. Paul, did we get all your questions? Oh, no, I got more. Yeah, <laughs> I'm ready for so it. Let's, let's spread this, it. I've been, this is a I've been doing this for years. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, uh, adopt a section eight. 3.42.070 failure failure to maintain units as affordable. Um, I, I won't go into reading all of this, but it, you know, it talks. How will this be monitored? How do we monitor this? How do we know if somebody's uh, maintaining a unit as an affordable unit? And is is my first read over there? It looks like it's got a 30 year period of of affordability. How, who how how do we track that? Probably the same way that they track it uh, right now, which is, uh, so one, anything that's deemed affordable is already being audited by the Oregon Housing Community Services. And if they ever find anything wrong with the audits, they're probably gonna report it to the jurisdiction that it falls within. So that would be one way that I would assume. Um, I would be curious to see how Milwaukee do, does it. Uh, Cause again, all of this that I've, that I've written out is actually straight from Milwaukee. Uh, I haven't really changed anything other than you know, to fit some things in for Estacada that fit Estacada better than Milwaukee, but really there's not much. I don't think I touched anything in this one. Um, so that being said, um, uh, I'd be curious to see how Milwaukee does it. And that probably comes out of the administrative cost from adopting this tax too. Okay. I would be curious to see that too. Um, one, It'd be also interesting to see, since this has been in place for a while, and again, many cities are doing it. So I, I'm, I really, I'm exciting, excited that we're looking towards something like this. Uh, but if it's been in place since 2016, it would be great, and maybe presented this in other ones, be great to see what some of the success stories are. How has this helped the lower income family or lower income uh, homes being built? How has this helped multi-family housing being built? Uh, I, at this point, it seems like it's, it gives us a pool of money and we can do something with. Um, I, I, I would love to know what it, what it does. And, and, and I wish that I had more time. I feel like I already took 10 minutes up with my presentation earlier about just what this exactly is. But I have taken so many tours of uh, when I went to Bend last year for the League of Oregon Cities conference, their annual conference, they had a tour of um, the, the success stories of how Bend has been able to use their construction excise tax to be able to, to revitalize areas in, throughout their city, not just in the greater Bend area, but there's so many areas where they've been able to use this money to make all these amazing programs. Um, Milwaukee also, when I was walking around downtown Milwaukee last year in June, it was raining outside, but they were so proud of what they were able to use some of their construction excise tax funds to, to be able to develop when it came to, you know, um, affordable housing in their downtown district, close to the mass transit, close to schools, close to businesses, close to transit. It was amazing. Um, I, and, I, and I wish that I had a lot of time to be able to present all of the success stories that have come from the construction excise tax throughout the state of Oregon. It has been one of the most successful housing programs developed in our state in a number of years. Um, and I'm really, really excited to see it come to Estacada. Good, thank you. Uh, Paul, any more questions you'd like to add in there before we move on? The, the only other one on here was the uh, 3.42.120. If somebody has a grievance, it's brought, brought before the city council and, and then mm -hmm. we would basically be the ones to hear out the grievance. Is that 
that typical? I mean, I'm new to city council. Is that typical for that kind of thing? Did you? Yes, this, this particular section actually came from our own city ordinances uh, that I, I, I didn't pull from Milwaukee's. I pulled it from our own. Okay, that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor, I got to jump off now. I think that Sadie and Matt can finish the last two things when you guys move on. Okay. All right. Well, we appreciate okay. you taking time out to be here. Thank you, Denise. Oh, that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I actually have a question as well. Okay. And then uh, I heard somebody else mention a question. Justin. Justin, go ahead. Uh, just real quick, Katie. Um, great job on all this, by the way. Um, how how did the other cities go about getting this approved did they do any kind of outreach to citizens did they just kind of say you know all right it's approved and then that was that was it they met and discussed it as an option and said that sounds like a great option and then they adopted it okay i think in the same meeting oh wow and that yeah. was that was Milwaukee that did that. I mean, lots of cities do that. You you can look at the list of cities um, through the Oregon Housing Community Services website. They have been tracking all of the cities that have either been adopting it or discussing adopting it. Yes. Um, and uh, from what I can tell, in Milwaukee, it was a pretty instantaneous decision. There there really wasn't a lot of discussion. A lot uh, there wasn't a lot of discussion about it. I'll say that. Okay. Justin, did that answer your question? Uh, sort of. Sort of? Okay. Yeah, I Is mean, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of with uh, Paul here and, and Jerry. I, I would just like to hear more from citizens and maybe even some of the construction people out here just to kind of get a feel. Well, hold on. I've already gone to the infrastructure committee, which included a lot of the construction people, and that's who told me that they want to see us put on the com the the construct or the uh, commercial construction excise tax. I've already jumped through that hoop. So you brought this to all the citizens in Estacada? No, I brought it to the infrastructure committee. That's what you guys wanted me to do last year, and I did it. No, I I understand. I'm, I'm actually not mad at all. I'm not jumping anywhere. I think this is a pretty good I idea. Obviously, it's worked out very well for other cities. Um, the concern is, is uh, we would the be the voice. only city ahead, on the Katie. list to, vote to, go, the, go to the voters. Go ahead. What were you saying? We would be the only city on this list to go to the voters if we did that. Okay. <clears throat> go ahead, Justin. Uh, is there anything else you want uh, to add? It's okay because I can't seem to get any words out. So. It's all good. No, it's your turn, Justin. But if you're suggesting that we go to the voters, we would literally be the only city to do that. And I'm really, that is would that a, be. Is that a problem? Is that horrible? Is that a bad thing? Okay, well, let's see if we got any more questions there. Uh, Casey or Kim? I have a couple questions. I'll get you uh, I know that this has been touched on, I think, a few times that one of my questions was if any of the other cities had seen any kind of a decline in constructors or building, but it sounds like that's not the case. Um, and my other question was, we're, so we've, we've narrowed it down that we're talking about only adding on footage to a, a, a home if you're doing a remodel. Is this a cumulative process? Like, what if I do two $50,000 projects or in one, like, 365 day year or is there anything related or is it just the one permit for the hundred thousand dollar project so anytime that you go for a building permit it's always based on your initial plan so whenever you present your plan for what your remodel is going to look like to the to the county or the the city whoever is issuing that permit um they're going to be using some sort of a metric system that's already laid out um, it's, it's in the ordinance as to exactly which one it's called, and I, I don't use the system enough to know exactly what it is, um, but it's basically the metric st standard that they use for the permit value, Okay. and the permit value is what's being taxed, and if that permit value exceeds what is that $100,000 threshold for additional square footage, okay. that's what is being taxed. So if your permit value, when you go into the county office or whoever is issuing that permit to you, um, if if they say it's not a hundred thousand dollars then it then it wouldn't be taxed 
But if I did two, you're not gonna, they wouldn't add them up if I did one in January and one in November. Okay, no. great. Um, I would say that um, I, I do have two concerns. Um, one is that we don't have a plan for the money right now. Um, and I feel like we're adding a tax and then we're gonna plan with the money that we get for it. And I would like to see at least some kind of a framework or structure. Oh. Aside from just very broad affordable housing programs, like that can mean anything. And so I'd be worried about what the, the eventual program manager we install, if they move forward with a different vision than we have in mind right now at this very moment. Um, and then I just would like to see more of a, of a structure for where those funds go. And I'm also a little wary that we're making assumptions about the accountability mechanism. I'd like to see that to be firm and we understand exactly what that looks like. How do we ensure that these homes stay affordable and stay at that 80% um, and know what that looks like and not just assume that it's gonna be the same as other cities have done it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Katie, do you have any rebuttal to that? And then I'll ask Casey. Well, to... Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm curious as to what kind of specificity that she was, or that uh, Councillor Abels would like to see when this was the exact ordinance adopted by Milwaukee and they don't seem to have had that problem. Do you know if they had an affordable, affordability housing structure uh, programming before that they adopted their ordinance? Uh, I mean, no, they've I had, didn't. They've had several programs built out and I know that, I mean, their county staff is much larger than ours. I, I, and so they, I, I would hate to have us end up with a bucket of money and then we don't have any staff to move any programming forward. So that's, that's all I'm asking is some kind of idea of what it would take um, to move it forward and, and what, what would our goals be for that money? What would we like to see are the key keystone um, initiatives that would come out of this aside from just in general affordable housing? Okay. Uh, yeah. That would be a great time to have that workshop that um, I've been asking for for a year to discuss those kinds of things. The only reason, and, and I realize Kim, that Count, Councilor Abels is uh, kind of new to this council. Um, I have been asking for a, uh, a workshop discussion to have that exact conversation that you're talking about since June of last year. And I really, really, really want to have that conversation. And I'm really kind of excited that now someone else is at the table who might want to have that conversation with me. So let's go ahead and do it. That would be a really great conversation to have. Okay, Casey. Got on my mute button. There we go. Um, <clears throat> the only thing, like, I, I got one question. Can we like with the taxes, like can it be like the 0.25 or something lower for say residential um, buildings, like when there's like a uh, uh, comp like that, not, what's the development? So that way, like we have something for developers, they'll have their tax for residential. And then we have something for um, also commercial but like an individual user who is looking just to have saved up their money to buy their first home or build their first home, or say that's remodeling their home and wanting to do addition that they're saving up their money for. I don't see adding a tax onto that kind of stuff when we should be happy that they're wanting to renovate and do stuff to their property. Mm -hmm. um, is that, do you have anything to add, Katie? Yes, hang on. I'm looking because there is a section in the ordinance that if any person does not decide or does not think that they should have to pay it, that there is a process for them to actually go before the city manager uh there shouldn't be a process to make someone have to be able to go through and not pay a tax on their property. I mean, we no, should have on. cut and dry rules already set out and not be like, well, you need to do this paperwork so that way you don't pay this 1% tax on your addition. That's not how no, a city should be on. running. Casey, 
any person who's already going through this process is already going through the to the city saying i want to pay my secs my systems development charges that i pay the city when i build anything on my land they i'm well aware i just did it yeah they already do that so if they go to the city and along with their sdcs pay a construction excise tax it's not a lot of extra work and they would be expected to do it in almost any of our neighboring cities right now and pretty soon Clackamas County is going to do it too and if they do it before we do we might not be able to do it. Matt do you have anything to add? Um, let's see here. Am I, I still on? Thank you for letting me finish then. Uh, I was asking if you wanted to add anything. You well I mean you were just expressing your feelings on this and I appreciate that but I mean I would like to also bring up a couple of other things because I mean Realistically, yes, that is something that they'll be paying for when they go to city to pay for their SDCs. However, that's still paperwork that you have to go through to deal with the city manager and asking for approval, which probably also then has to go to city council for that approval. It's a process which I'm saying we shouldn't have. If there was a way to just say, hey, if you're a developer and you're doing subdivisions, here's a 0.25% tax that we have on your development. Here we have for also commercial, but if you're a residential and you're only doing it for yourself, we're not going to charge you. It's a very simple cut and dry kind of thing that you can make and then cut out having extra paperwork and bureaucratic stuff that people have to do and saving the city also time trying to tell them, well, you have to do this and helping them go through other processes. Also, when we're saying that the money would be then transferred to the next homeowner, that's true. However, I know a lot of people that trying to save up just enough PMI money to that 20% for a new home is a lot for a new home builders or a homeowner. So also tacking on an additional 1%, that could be pretty strenuous on a lot of people that are trying to borrow money from family and friends to buy their first home. Okay. Now, Matt, you wanna add anything to that? Oh, uh, well, um, I don't know that it's staff position, that it's necessarily my position as staff to, to take a position here. Um, but what I'm hearing is that it seems like there's some consensus among the council that uh, the concept that's being presented here, everyone is pretty much supportive of the, some of the differences of opinion we're ha having are primarily around the details of the programming and implementation and enforcement, um, accountability, et cetera. So if the council at this point in time feels like we like the concept, but we're concerned about the details, uh, maybe it's time then to task staff with fleshing out some of these details and bringing it back for uh, uh, a vote at a later time. I'm not saying that's the way to go. It's a way to go if we're stuck tonight anyway. And I, I think you're right on that. From what I'm hearing out there, there's a lot of a lot of questions still to answer. I think the concept is sound. I think we need to head in that direction, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of questions still out there for people to be more comfortable with this situation. Um, and I would like to have that answered uh, in a very clear and concise and uh, friendly way so that we don't uh, get in each other's uh, uh, craw, I should say. So um, I agree. I think we should uh, have staff bring it back to us with a more question and answer kind of thing so we can be better prepared uh, for this vote when we decide to do this. But I think it needs to be on the table. I don't think we should pull it off the table. I don't wanna see it sidelined because it's something that's very important. Whether any of you know it or not, developers are raising the cost of homes every day in our area. That isn't gonna change. It's nice to see that Estacada could receive cash from something like this to actually accommodate our community and making it strong is important to us too. So I hope we'd look at that when we move along with this, but I am in agreement. I think we should move this to a, maybe a workshop of some kind so we can answer all the questions out there and maybe get a clarity as to what we want to do and how we want to do it. So I can appreciate that and I would recommend staff do that. Um, are there any more questions for Katie before we move on? No? Okay, uh, we will move on to the next proposal. Thank you, Katie, for the presentation. It was well done. Oh, Kim, would you like to speak? Yeah, I just want to say thank you to Katie. This is a ton of work, and I understand that, and I know this is probably not the outcome that you wanted, um, but I am here to advocate with you and to push this forward and to have the conversations we need to have to get this across the table. I know Mayor uh, Drinkwine said 
Do you have a rebuttal? I hope you didn't think I was arguing with you. I didn't, I wasn't thinking of it as a, as a mock debate. I just wanted to be able to ask a couple of questions. Um, and this is okay. a ton of work and let's move this forward. I appreciate that. You know, um, I have, like I, like I mentioned earlier, I have been fighting this good fight for really as long as I've taken my seat. I'm not going to give it up. Um, I will be continuing to push forward a construction excise tax because I really and honestly want to see housing diversity in Estacada. That is my, that is my hope for Estacada and I'm not going to give up. This is the exact outcome I expected tonight. Um, because it is the exact outcome that I have gotten every time I have spoken since I took my seat. So thank you. We really appreciate you, Katie. You did a good job presenting. So thank you. Um, moving along to the next thing on the list, we have the public access committee uh, dissolution. Uh, we've talked about this. Uh, Sadie, you have some information on this. I think tonight we're looking to uh, dissolve that. So we need a motion to do so. Is that right? Okay, so. Mayor, Mayor Drinkwine, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. I was just hoping for purposes of the minutes and also so that staff has clarity. Um, is, the, is the direction that the council is giving staff right now um, to set up a work session, is that yes. the, what the council would like to do? I think we need that clarification in order yes, to and schedule that's exactly that and move where, that forward. Yeah, I think that's where we need to go is a a workshop of some kind to talk directly to this construction excise tax, have the information at the table that we need to be better prepared, I think would be a good idea. And that's what we're recommending to staff at this time. Okay. And the council concurs. I just want to make sure. Uh, the council in agreement? Yes. That's unfair. I think that's a consensus, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, public assets committee dissolution. That's what we're at right now. Um, I guess we need a motion to do so. Move so, to dissolve the Estacada Public Access Committee. Okay, I have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion passes. Uh, we're back up to resolution 2020-015. A resolution of the Estacada City Council uh, desecrated the uh, Estacada Enterprise Zone for electronic commerce. And I'm going to hand this to you, Matt, because you can fill us in on what this really entails. Okay, thank you. I apologize. I missed the first part of the meeting. Um, so I don't know what discussion has already taken place. Would you care to bring me up to speed first? <laughs> yeah, we haven't had any discussion on that particular subject. We saved it just for you. <laughs> oh, okay, great. <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, I think this, I tried to be thorough in my staff report without making it so lengthy that I lost your interest, but uh, the, the, the bottom line here is that, um, you know, economic development, uh, it, it's typically not successful if you put all your eggs in one basket, and I don't think we're doing that. We're doing a good job of promoting our industrial campus, uh, rebuilding downtown and making it vibrant looking at housing diversity, um, looking at uh, different um, employment sectors that we can target. And we're taking a multifaceted approach. And so this is just one other tool I'm hoping to add into that multifaceted toolbox. Um, about six months ago, Business Oregon gave notice to cities throughout the state that there would be three um, open slots to designate your enterprise zone, your existing enterprise zone as, um, uh, as having an e-commerce overlay. So if, um, if a data center in our example, or say a online commerce distribution center or a call center where they're ful fulfilling uh, orders and doing customer service, um, in most situations, those types of facilities would not be eligible for our enterprise zone uh, tax abatement and, and exemptions. Um, this e-commerce overlay would now make these e-commerce businesses eligible for the enterprise zone tax abatements. Um, typically, that's a three-year abatement for uh, vertical improvements um, in uh, uh, fixed machinery. So things that are like bolted to the building and are effectively a part of the factory, as it were. Um, uh, it, it doesn't include 
uh, moving fleet like vehicles or forklifts or um, say phone systems or any of those types of things but um, things like servers the building that the building that, that the servers are in um, even the mechanical systems as long as they're part of the building and the facility um, these are all things that could have their taxes abated for three years and the reason why we offer that is to try and incentivize a firm that's looking at uh, say they're looking at Malala and Estacada. Estacada has the e-commerce overlay and Malala doesn't. It makes it uh, sort of an easier decision for this business that's thinking about locating in Clackamas County. Um, it gives us a little bit of a competitive advantage. It does mean that we forego some tax revenue in the short term, but once those improvements are made and the abatement period expires, usually it's three years, it could be up to five if they were really making major investments and employing people at high high wages um, but in in most situations it's going to be a three-year abatement once that expires off the the property is assessed and in perpetuity then moving forward it's added to the tax roll so it's a little front end incentive to get a company to reload to locate here uh minimize some of those um startup costs in their expansion and then and then it, and it sunsets off after a time period. So it's, again, it's one tool in the toolbox that we're just looking to add. I think it would be good to make, give us a competitive advantage in Clackamas County. I believe we'd be the only jurisdiction. I take that back. Sandy has the e-commerce overlay. Um, we would be the second in the county to have the e-commerce overlay. Um, and, and that's, I think what I'll say, and then if you have questions, I'm happy to field those. Okay. Um, do we have any questions for Matt regarding this? I not seen any hands. Uh, Paul. So the, the enterprise zone, we already have that in place, right? And that already allows for tax abatements at some level. Is that right? Correct. Right now, it's mainly offered to um, two types of, of um, businesses. It would be a headquarters which we're probably not gonna have in our industrial campus because the zoning doesn't, uh, for the most part, allow for just like a straight office complex. Uh, so most of what we're seeing uh, people take advantage of is if they're a manufacturing facility, if they're doing uh, uh, the production of traded sector goods. Traded sector just meaning it's something that's gonna be uh, uh, sold and exported outside of the Estacada area. So those are the type of businesses right now that are eligible as traded sector manufacturing businesses. So the, the data companies, data companies that you'd suggested, uh, you know, to try to, you know, that we'd hopefully entice to come over here, they would not fall within that already, right? Correct. Yeah. And unless they were, could somehow fall under that um, headquarters definition, which is a fairly loose definition, but this makes it a lot easier to market our enterprise zone as an e-commerce friendly enterprise zone. It gives us something to say. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it does, yeah. stuff, but it also, we can say we are, and we have the electronic commerce overlay as well too. And, and that might be something people look for. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, the, these companies um, that are looking to establish data centers, um, they're, they're familiar with the, and I hate to trivialize it, but the game of economic development, part of that game is um, sometimes incentives based. And so they ask those types of questions when they're looking at different jurisdictions within a region. They're going to ask who has an enterprise zone and who doesn't, who has a uh, an additional incentive for e-commerce and who doesn't. They kind of know how it works. It, to be completely honest with you, my dream vision in the economic development world would just be that incentives actually go away. <laughs> that there was this sort of uh, peace agreement among states, among cities, among counties, that no one's going to offer incentives anymore to just make it a perfectly level playing field. But I don't think that's going to happen. And it sort of forces our hand to play the game as well. And that's, that's what we're doing with an enterprise zone and also by adding this e-commerce overlay. Thank you. Any more questions for Matt? Uh, Katie? 
I've got one. So Matt, I'm noticing on the map that uh, the the current enterprise zone does not fall within our urban renewal agency boundary, does it? So none it, of, huh? Uh, it, no, it, it doesn't. It's, it's really uh, limited to the former boundaries of the M1 zone. Um, I noted in my staff report that the boundaries of our enterprise zone need to be updated and that's something that we'll work on in the in the near term. Um, but for right now, the eligible areas are the former boundaries of the old M1 zone um, as it was before the uh, recent comprehensive plan map changes were adopted. And so there's no real uh, uh, way that a, a that a business would be eligible for tax abatement and any urban renewal grant do dollars, correct? Uh, that's that's right. Yeah, okay. because down, downtown uh, is the only area where we have urban renewal and downtown is not within the enterprise zone boundaries. You're right, you, they couldn't double dip. Well, <laughs> I, I do like that idea a little bit better. Thank you. Um, perfect, that was my one question, thank you. Sure. Okay. Any more questions for, for Matt? No? All right, um, I think we're about ready to, you need a, a motion on this, is that right, Matt and Sadie? Uh, yes, please. Okay, so you've heard the resolution, the resolution of the Escada City Council designating the uh, Escada Enterprise Zone for Electronic Commerce. Uh, that is the motion. Um, do I have one on the floor? I so move. Okay, I have a first on the floor, do I have a second? I'll second. You have a first and second, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you all for that. All right. And we thank you, Matt, for the explanation. And we thank you, Sadie, <laughs> for hanging in there with us. Um, we are now at the uh, next citizen and community group comment. Do I have any Sadie on the line? Yes. Joel would like to come in and make a um, comment. Okay. So give me one moment. Okay, Joel. You're on mute still, buddy. Too many mute okay. buttons on this. Um, okay, so can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. All right. Uh, I was just, uh, this is actually going to come back to the uh, to what you guys were discussing just a little bit earlier about the uh, ordinance 2020-002. Okay. Um, and I wanted to ask about uh, Katie a question about that. Um, the well, the, the funds that come off of that tax, first of all, I think the tax is a great idea as a citizen, just to kind of put that out there. But um, the question I had about that: Would the funds that come off that tax uh, be used to support uh, increasing and uh, reinforcing infrastructure in the town for as we grow with uh, multi-family units and you know putting towards like you know the waterways and you know, maybe uh, like redoing our uh, our uh, water plant or maybe uh, fixing roads and traffic flow? That's a good question, Joel, thank you. Um, actually, so unfortunately, the, the law is pretty specific about what we can and cannot spend the money on. And when it comes to the residential construction excise tax, which is you know the single family homes that are being developed right now, um, those, those taxes would not go into a fund that could help us pay for projects like that, anything relating to our infrastructure. However, the, com the commercial construction excise tax, 50% of the funds that we collect from that excise tax could actually go to support things like what you were asking about wastewater facility plants and things like that. Um, that's actually what's kind of exciting about the, com the commercial part of that is that it could go toward infrastructure development as it's written in the ordinance. In fact, anything that we have a comprehensive plan for as a city, whether it be our parks, you know, when if we wanted to throw money toward Wade Creek uh, Phase Three or the Riverside development down on Lakeshore, um, you know, any of that kind of stuff, uh, we could use the commercial construction excise tax to help uh, create a fund for. So yeah, we could. Awesome. Well, that was just the main question I had there for that. Thank you. Okay. We appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have anybody else on the line, Sadie? No? Okay. We want to thank all the citizens for commenting tonight. We appreciate your comments and we are processing everything that you say and trying to figure out the best way to handle it from this point. So we thank you for that. Um,
We are now at mayor and council reports. So I will start off with Jerry. Um, do you have anything to report? Uh, nothing to report. Thank you, Katie, for bringing that presentation to us. Um, I, I, I do think the excise tax is a good idea. I just think we need to refine it. And, you know, like what uh, Kimberly said, we need to have uh, something in place. And we'll talk about that at the workshop. But uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, staff, you're doing an amazing job. We, we could not do this without you guys. Um, Mr. Mayor, thank you. And uh, see you guys next time. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Paul. I, I want to echo what Jerry said. Katie, appreciate what you brought here. Um, I want to do whatever I can do to help get this thing firmed out and figured out as quickly as possible as well, too. Um, I definitely want to be a part of the solution here to make this happen. Thank you, Paul. Okay, Katie. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Um, Casey. Uh, have a good night. Thank you. Kimberly. Uh, no additional comments. Have a good night, guys. Okay, thank you. Justin. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, and from me, since I'm the last one on the list, I thank all of you for coming out tonight. I thank staff for putting in the time. It's a lot of work and long hours, and we appreciate you. Um, and I want to thank Katie for presenting. You did a great job. I know it's a lot of work and sometimes it's very discouraging when things don't go quite the way you hope they would. I can appreciate that. Not always is it gonna work out the way you think it is, um, but we will get back to this. We're not forgetting this. We're not taking it away. We're going to discuss it. We're gonna figure this out. And we're gonna come back to the table with something that works. So we appreciate you, so thank you. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for tuning in tonight to this council meeting and the interest that is now formed around the community to actually find out what we are doing and how we are doing it. I appreciate all of you out there. So thank you again. And this meeting is adjourned.